Flanders is the chief photographer on the flight, and recently David Schumacher asked him uh, what he hopes to take pictures of. Well, as our uh, operational uh, requirements will permit, we will try to uh, photograph as much of the moon, uh, significant parts of it, as we can, uh, particularly in an attempt to do a continuous strip mapping from the relatively well-known features on the front side back to the relatively not so well-known features on the back side. Uh, this all has, uh, besides any scientific connotations, uh, has operational connotations in that a lunar landing vehicle coming in on a landing approach uh, would like to have uh, a very good knowledge of the lunar grid so that it can uh, cut down its landing error as much as possible. And the back side of the moon is not too well known, uh, absolutely, this time. Well, now, haven't we done an awful lot of lunar photography already with uh, past unmanned shots? What really do you contribute with your camera? The orbiter photography uh, was very good, uh, particularly on the near side of the moon, at our particular landing sites, where we can, from these photographs, we can study them in detail and pick uh, sites that would be uh, uh, relatively smooth and offer a good chance of a safe landing point. But the, uh, where the orbiter photography was not so good, because the orbiter was in a highly elliptical orbit, uh, it was approximately 1,000 miles away from the back side of the moon, the coverage is good, but not good enough for our navigational purposes. And we hope to improve upon that uh, with our onboard photographic equipment. The transmission from the spacecraft uh, to Mission Control in Houston uh, is going on now, but it's all just a set of figures. It's uh, the engineering data that they must have before they fire this engine for the second time uh, to uh, circularize their orbit around the moon. And uh, it is really meaningless uh, engineering jargon to those of us on Earth who really don't have a spacecraft in our backyard and don't intend to make uh, this flight any time in the immediate future. Uh, about those pictures on the moon, though, uh, that uh, we were just hearing about from Bill Anders. Terry Drinkwater, uh, I'm wondering if out there at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, perhaps Dr. Shoemaker can tell us about the pictures of the moon we already have taken uh, through our unmanned uh, satellites and what the astronauts will return that is better and more useful than those. That, that, I think, is, is the question. Uh, what more can, can they take pictures of, and how different are, are their photographs going to be, say, compared to Lunar Orbiter? Uh, could you give an example of a Lunar Orbiter photograph and uh, compare it to what they'll do? Well, as, the, as has already been mentioned, we have very good photographs and almost complete coverage of the back side. Uh, there are literally thousands of these photographs taken by Lunar Orbiter. I have one of them. I'm going to hold it right side up, so north is at the top here, that's upside down for this book. This is a picture taken of the backside from a rather great distance by Lunar Orbiter 3 and shows the prominent feature first seen by the Soviet spacecraft Luna 2, uh, which is now named Tsiolkovsky. And you can see that it has a great deal of detail. And over here, And uh, this then puts him in a position where he's, where he's ready to go. At uh, 30 seconds prior to the burn, he will do a plus X translation with his uh, translational controller in his left hand. This fires the, the RCS engines and gives the vehicle a small acceleration. If you, as you've explained that to me, Leo, it's, it's simply a, a jolt to put all the fuel in the tanks in the right position for use. That's right, that's an Ullich maneuver. In zero G, the SPS propellants may be floating right in the center of the tank. So we have to settle the propellants to the bottom so we can get ignition on the SPS engine. So he'll do this with an Ullich maneuver, a plus X maneuver with his hand controller. He'll have this switch in auto at this time. So the accelerometer in the entry monitor system will be sensing even this small acceleration with the RCS engines and the Delta V counter will start to count off very slowly. Uh, this is done at uh, about 15 seconds prior to the burn. Then at five seconds prior to the burn, 
the disky or the computer will start to blink a verb 99 uh, asking if the crew if they're ready for the burn if they are they'll press this button right here this then uh, completes the circuitry for the burn and at the uh, the correct time the GNN will send a signal to the SPS and the SPS engine will light off uh, this is indicated to the crew by the SPS light coming on up here and the chamber pressure going up to about 105 or 110 and they'll also feel a 1G environment again. The SPS engine gives them an acceleration of about 1G so they'll go from a weightless condition to 1G in, in their couches. From weightless to in effect uh, an earth gravity condition but only for a few seconds. Yes, this burn's only going to be a nine second burn so as the uh, engine ignites the delta V counter will start to count off very rapidly and when the delta V counter reaches essentially zero, the GNN will shut the burn off. And then they'll go back to a weightless condition again. Is all this information that makes this automatic sequence possible uh, fed in by the men aboard the spacecraft or pumped in from the ground and double checked from the ground? How does it work? Uh, yes, uh, when they were on their last orbit, the, uh, the ground controller uh, gave them all the update information for their computer and they loaded it in to get ready for oh. this LOI burn, this lunar orbit insertion number two. Perhaps the information Walter was talking about, very technical engineering data. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if the engine does not shut off exactly as it's supposed to, presumably they go ahead and turn it off by hand. Well, if the engine should not shut off, uh, all the Frank would have to do would be hit these two guards down and they're designed to knock the switches down and when these two switches go off that will terminate the thrust on the SPS engine. But again Leo isn't it as it was before in deciding whether to circle the moon in the first place in the elliptical orbit isn't it again happening while they're out of communication with Earth so that we won't really know until they come back from the far side whether everything has gone as planned. That's right. This will be done on uh, out of communications. However, uh, as soon as they complete their burn, they will be able to call up on their computer and they will know whether they had a good burn and uh, what their delta V was and uh, what their apogee and perigee. You talk about the jolt that the people in the spacecraft feel when these engines come on and presumably they felt it before for a matter of what, four minutes and five seconds in that first burn of the uh, service propulsion engine. We hear so much about uh, first the Earth's gravity and then the attraction of the moon. Is there any sensation of being pulled one way or another within the spacecraft as you shift from the primary attraction of the Earth to primary attraction of the moon? No, you're in zero G in all cases. The only time the crew would be feeling any uh, accelerations would be when the engine was firing. And the SPS engine, as I mentioned before, is approximately a 1G engine. So when that engine is burning, uh, they're feeling uh, 1G on their back in the couch, same as if you were lying in your couch here on Earth. But, but only uh, briefly. Oh, just as long as the engine is firing. Then, then when they circle the moon, there's no sensation, and the, these simplified charts, I think, sometimes can be misleading in that way. There's no sensation of, uh, for instance, leaning outward, as you would in a car taking a curve. No, the, the, uh, the pull of the moon's gravitational field is equal and opposite to the centrifugal force of the vehicle. So the, the crew in the spacecraft orbiting the moon essentially are at zero G and they have no sensation of, of weight whatsoever. The weightlessness continues, whether they're circling the Earth as they did in Gemini and in this, or circling the moon in Apollo. Hmm? Right. So Walter, a great deal of very technical information as you've said, but uh, all of it critical at this point in the flight. And put so uh, succinctly and clearly that uh, even I can understand it, uh, thanks to you and uh, Leo, Bill. The uh, one fact uh, uh, might be mentioned regarding the fact there is no sensation on the part of these astronauts, of course, in their translunar uh, phase of the flight. They have no reference points uh, going by their window uh, that would give any indication of acceleration, speed. And since they are weightless, there is none. Uh, the same, and since there is no atmosphere, there is no wind whistling by to give them any uh, auditory sensation. The same thing would be true going around the moon as going around the Earth uh, in that orbit. Once they look out the window and look at the moon moving below them, or look out uh, as they do in the Earth orbit, look at the Earth moving below them, they would get some sensation, of course, of speed. Uh, they are a little closer. Uh, on the far side of the moon on this uh, egg-shaped orbit than they have been in most of the Earth orbits by 
around, uh, oh, a margin of about 50% closer at 70 miles instead of 130 miles in Earth orbit. But on the this side of the moon where they have been doing the photography with the television camera, they're around 131 miles up. 138, I think the actual figure given to us. 132 was the figure given to us at the point where they began taking the television pictures, and that's just about the same as an Earth orbit.